Hey, James here. Today going to be reviewing another Italian genre film, a giallo, Hatchet for the Honeymoon. Uh, one of Mario Bava's less talked about giallis, um, he really just directed five, um, depending on your definition of jolly. Um, for me personally, I tend to have a very broad definition. I would definitely lump this in here. Uh, I don't think it has enough supernatural elements for me to personally disqualify it. And um, it has a lot of the elements, but um, it's certainly not in the mold of uh, Bird with the Crystal Plumage and Blood and Black Lace. But going to talk about that in just a second. Um, the synopsis is a madman haunted by the ghost of his ex-wife carves a corpse-laden trail. Um, so yeah, we basically have a killer who is um, killing um, a bunch of uh, women uh, brides, rather. Um, and as he kills, he slowly uh, gets a little bit more of his memory back uh, towards a childhood trauma. Really simple premise, um, kind of bizarre in a very way that is very normal for kind of uh, giallo films of this era. Um, so I, I originally saw this film um, a few years ago when I was just first getting into giallo films. And um, I don't know that it was necessarily my favorite uh, on the first watch, but it was also definitely very early on in my giallo watching where I was like, all right, watch everything from Bava and Argento. This one's by Bava, so I'll check it out. Um, and so was not a huge fan then. And so coming back to it now, and at this point I've seen well over a hundred Jolly films. So I would say I'm reasonably well versed in the genre and kind of the tropes and stuff like that. And coming back to it, um, this is a really, really weird Jolly film. It's, it's very unusual. Um, I do feel like this is kind of a one of a kind film. So in that sense, I actually really have started to um, appreciate uh, how different this film actually is. Uh, first of all, uh, there's just not much of a mystery to it. Right from the get-go, uh, the killer's point of view, we're, we're kind of introduced to the killer's point of view, who basically says, I am a psychopath. And in that sense, um, this feels a lot like, and I'm far from the first person to make this comparison, um, American Psycho with kind of its voiceover and stuff like that. Uh, people have also compared it to Psycho uh, because it has to do with a, a killer basically and his mommy issues. Um, so, in that sense, it's just really, really different from those films, uh, such as Blood and Black Lace and Bird with the Crystal Plumage. And why is that? This comes out in 1970, right in the golden age of Jello, and it actually comes out after the Bird with the Crystal Plumage. But I think what's really interesting is to look at the timeline of the Mario Bava Jelly, um, and he really only had one that was developed after Bird with the Crystal Plumage came out. This film, as well as Five Dollars for an August Moon, both were uh, released after Bird with the Crystal Plumage, I believe, in 1970, but they were in development before Bird. So as a result, um, they have less of that Black Glove killer um, influence on it uh, because Bird with the Crystal Plumage was a massive hit and kind of brought on those influx of giallos and kind of the tropes that we associate with them. Uh, of course, these were um, kind of a, a lot of these tropes were originally come up with by uh, Baba himself uh, when he did Blood and Black Lace and The Girl Who Knew Too Much much earlier, but those films were not hits in the same way that Bird with the Crystal Plumage was. So it's interesting. I, I do feel like this is kind of a very interesting era of Jalo, and it's not the one that people's minds first go to. Um, and if they do go to kind of this period, it'd be kind of more of the Lindsay Jet Set Jalos, and that's not really what this is either. Um, instead, it's a fairly interesting um, kind of uh, psychosexual, uh, very psychological film uh, done by uh, Mary Bava uh, about the serial killer. And it has just a 100% different feel um, from, um, from your typical jollies coming out in this 1970 to 1972, 1973 period. Um, yeah, so in that sense, I do give this film props uh, for just being really interesting. Like a lot of Bava's films, it looks fantastic. Uh, the guy is just a technical craftsman. Supposedly this film had a lot of budget issues. I'm sure that's true, uh, but it doesn't show. I, I, and one thing that is just consistently impressive about Baba is the way uh, he's just technical uh, prowess. And he's basically a savant when it comes to this stuff and just generating something amazing out of uh, just very, very limited resources. So I think uh, in that sense, Pairing him into a Spanish castle, which is where this is filmed, uh, literally owned by uh, Franco, the dictator of Spain at the time, is just a really, really um, 
inspired way to come together. Supposedly, it wasn't necessarily the very happiest work conditions there, but it's, it doesn't necessarily show up on the actual work, which I think are generally, uh, looks really, really good. I don't think there's quite blood and black love, lace level of richness in, uh, in the film, but it still nevertheless is uh, a very striking film. I say that as my own lighting goes to shit. <laughs> uh, but uh, this, uh, this film, um, yeah, it's not as rich as Blood and Black Lace, but it is uh, just as usual for Baba. Uh, his strength is, is really in those things. Uh, things that don't totally work for me, um, this film does rely a lot on its lead, uh, played by Stephen Forsythe, uh, playing an eight-character named John Harrington, to carry it. Um, he's he's okay. I'm not going to say he was bad, but it's a lot to ask for an actor to give a compelling performance that's just going to hold your attention for basically the whole feature length, especially when we're being invited into him. And I don't think he totally can do that. So there are parts of this film uh, that can definitely feel a little bit dull, in my opinion, at least. And Bob's strength is just not necessarily with the actors. Um, he is a very, very technically skilled director, but I mean, he doesn't, he's not speaking English where uh, this is being dubbed to, and uh, he doesn't necessarily have um, like acting coach or, or someone like that. So uh, I do think the performances are not necessarily the best, kind of par for the course for a lot of films here, but uh, in this film in particular, uh, where the body count is a little bit lower and relies on these performances and doesn't have some of the uh, grandiose killings of something like Bay of Blood, I think it does tend to suffer a little bit. Look-wise, um, the gothic setting um, works really well, and in that sense, it kind of um, marries uh, the two sort of Baba Jolly and Baba Gothic together. I feel like this film does kind of have that gothic feel, almost solely suit due to that really castle-like set. Um, takes advantage of just those massive ceilings and stuff like that. And that's a lot of what people like, myself included, of these European jollies. Just they have these incredible settings and they know how to use them really, really well in these uh, very entertaining uh, murder mysteries. Um, another uh, cool thing about the sets too, um, there's a really cool mannequin set, which is kind of like uh, John Harrington's secret room where he takes people. Um, you'll definitely get hints of Blood and Black Lace if you've seen that. And it kind of hints at sort of like the artifice uh, in front of like kind of the dual personas, how he portrays this kind of like very handsome guy on the outset, but in deep dark, uh, but in the interior, he's sort of, um, I mean, he's a psychopath, literally, as he says in his own words. So the mannequin sets and stuff like that kind of, I'm sure if you were doing a PhD, you could write a whole dissertation uh, based off of that stuff. But I do think that stuff is cool uh, just as a set and uh, Baba uh, knows how to do that. There's a really cool scene um, where he's talking with Mildred, who he's basically in a loveless marriage and they are talking and it kind of turns negative. And it's a moment right before he kills her. And we just see the reflection of each other on the butcher knife. So there's like lots of just really, really creative touches like that that don't cost money, but are really um, just add a visual dy uh, dynam dynamism uh, to the film. Um, when Mildred eventually is killed, we do see the um, hand dripping from like the very top of the stairs. And because this is a Spanish castle, it's a massive set. And so it's just slowly dripping down. And that's a fairly suspenseful scene uh, in the film. All right, so who won the movie? Gonna give this to Mario Baba. Um, I think this is definitely his film. And in terms of actors and stuff like that, I don't think there's anyone that really competes with him. I wish he had a little bit more budget, uh, kind of install a more memorable soundtrack to this. Um, in the end, I think this is a film I admire more than I like. I do like it more than I did when I originally saw it a few years back. Um, and I think just a huge reason is variety is just nice to have, and it's nice to have different types of jello. We don't want to just have the exact same type. And this type film really is kind of one of a kind and just really unique and different and stands out amongst uh, both Jolly as well as sort of Baba's uh, just whole repertoire. So uh, I think it's also a film that probably does benefit from a rewatch and kind of that power of expectations there, knowing what to expect and just knowing it's more of a journey into this killer's mind than a um, kind of your standard black glove killer uh, knockoff uh, from Blood and Black Lace or Bird with the Crystal Plumage. So 7 out of 10, solid film. 
Um, definitely uh, not close to the best of Baba, uh, just very middle of the pack in terms of that, but a good film and definitely one worth checking out for anyone remotely interested in both Giallo and uh, Baba's work. Um, I will see you all next time.